Welcome to a special episode of the CEC Report. I'm Robert Bowick. My guest today is Philip Seuss. Welcome, Philip. Glad to be here, Robbie. Thanks. In this episode of the CEC Report, we're calling it Only Fraud Can Turn Around Falling House Prices. And that's why Philip's here, because Philip is one of Australia's leading experts on the subject of mortgage fraud. And what we want to do is establish a, an understanding for the viewer that, that there's a lot of hype in Australia at the moment or post-election that um, the housing uh, price falls are going to turn around now, come into the market, first home buyers come into the market, etc. Um, and we can push prices back up again. And the, what we're going to establish in today's episode, I mean, you know, pause right now if you're watching this on YouTube and go and get anyone you know who's about to... to sign up to a mortgage, right? You have to understand the trap that is being laid here, the debt trap, because there is a story that, the, that was barely covered in the Royal Commission that we're gonna go through today that um, only if you understand how much fraud there has been in the Australian banking system to do with mortgages, can you appreciate how all the efforts so far they've come up with, uh, if, if they turn this, the market around again, it means they've resorted to outright fraud again, all right? So, that, I just want to say that before we get started. So, um, Philip, let's give the viewers a bit of a sense of who you are. You're from, you're a PhD student on this subject. You're doing a PhD, but you're also part of Aleph Economics. So tell us a bit about that. Okay, I'm an economist and uh, several years ago formed a consulting research business with Lindsay David, who's well known in these circles. And I'm also currently doing my PhD on uh, housing and uh, banking. Uh, specifically looking at the uh, risks uh, around what we call uh, control fraud in the mortgage markets. Now you, um, this is an interesting term, con control fraud, which comes from a book written by William K. Black called The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. And you recommend that I read this book, and I did, and it blew my mind because of what the little bit I know about the, the mortgage fraud in Australia. This was warned about decades ago. Right, it should, it, and, and, it, and it should never have been allowed to happen if, if you know this book existed. Right, mm. The regulators have deliberately allowed it to happen um, based on this. But g give us your own sense of that. And also, you had, you, you've had a lot to do with Denise Braley of the Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association, who's probably done more than anyone to battle this on the front line in terms of the, for, the, for the actual victims of this fraud. Well, that book was uh, published by Professor William K. Black, who's of the modern, uh, modern monetary theory group in the United States. And back in the 80s, he used to be a lawyer and a uh, regulator on the bank board, which was the uh, industry regulator for the savings and loan uh, industry. And during that time in, in the 80s, uh, there was a horrific uh, a series of frauds uh, culminating in the, um, around 1989, 1990. And that led to um, uh, quite a few high-profile um, bankruptcies and also over 10,000 um, criminal referrals and over 1,000 uh, criminal convictions of um, yep. uh, industry insiders who were committing a, a lending fraud um, using these savings and loan thrifts as, as their vehicle for uh, criminality. And with his experiences, uh, William Black, he looked at current economic theory that states that uh, the more you deregulate and privatise um, a financial market, the more allegedly efficient it should become. Yeah. But instead, the real... Because it self-regulates, doesn't it? That's the idea. It's supposed to self-regulate. Uh, indeed. Uh, that's very much been an MO uh, since the 80s with the turn towards um, from Keynesian economics to neoliberal uh, economics uh, throughout the West. However, reality taught a very hard lesson and it shows that uh, the neoliberal ideology which advocates uh, uh, privatisation and deregulation actually led to the opposite. It led to the uh, savings and loan thrifts becoming um, what we call criminogenic. Yeah. That is an environment susceptible to the um, conduct of uh, criminal activity. And from that, uh, his uh, lessons, including um, having warned about the upcoming GFC uh, during the 2000s because there, there was an epidemic of uh, white collar crime. Yeah. He saw it again, yeah. And in fact, it got so bad that even the National Police, the FBI, testified before Congress in September 2004, saying there was an epidemic of white-collar crime in the mortgage industry, and the government and regulators did nothing. And of course, that had predictable um, effects with the hyperinflation of house prices. Yeah. 
which was then followed by the hyper uh, deflation of house, house prices, which then blew up the um, economy, including um, all throughout the West. And from that, um, Bill Black uh, uh, wrote his book, and uh, it, the title really says it all, and it's uh, quite humorous as well. Yep, the best way to rob a bank is to own one. He, uh, there's a section in there towards the end where he talks about this uh, uh, interaction between Brooksley Bourne, who, if anyone knows, was the, the one regulator advocating more regulation, and Alan Greenspan. And Greenspan said to her, we will not see eye to eye on fraud. And she said, what's no not to see eye to eye on? And he said, well, I don't believe we should regulate fraud. And that, that you know, if that's the top regulator in America saying the fraud will take care of itself, you know, they're just deliberately looking the other way. It, it shows you the criminality goes right to the top. Oh, absolutely. And it's uh, sanctioned from the top, even though those at the top may not have a direct hand in committing it, they've definitely uh, allowed uh, the space to emerge uh, f uh, for this criminogenic um, activity to occur. So how did you get interested in the Black Book uh, well, and, and Black's work and Australia? How did that come about? Well, the concerns are with Australia is that there's obviously a housing bubble. We have epic levels of private debt. Uh, that needs no explanation. And uh, in the course of doing my research, I came across Denise Braley's work and that seemed to be uh, quite a uh, tight fit with uh, what uh, yeah. Professor Black has been saying um, over the decades. And so I met with her years ago and I, the first time I met her, I provided her a copy with uh, Black's book. And for her, that was also um, an important moment because finally she could uh, merge what sh the realities yes. she was seeing on the ground um, with, with the theory of uh, what Black was saying, including showing why mainstream economic theory is just nonsense when it comes to banking and finance. And it's interesting, Denise is a criminologist and brings that to, to the table on this mm. subject. And Black was a regulator and a lawyer and he went and became a criminologist to help explain what he had experienced in the SNL crisis. And that informs his book as well. Now, and, and th there's a lesson to be learned from that because, you know, uh, why do criminologists get to see this aspect of the financial system that no one else in regulators can see well because it's crime that's, mm, that's mm. why but it's white collar crime and of course that's what you know white collar crime is a special kind of crime that that the uh, perpetrators usually get away with unless someone's trained to look at it and i, I, did, I must say there's a um the other parallels with there's a, the famous 1933 pecora inquiry into the u.s financial system mm. and and the, and the crash because all these lawyers couldn't find the crimes, but he was a criminal prosecutor, Ferdinand Pecora, came in, saw exactly the same things, but detected crimes there, and was able to um, expose them and bring, to, bring about the fundamental changes that Roosevelt implemented. Um, all right, so we've now had um, uh, a royal commission into the banking system in Australia, right, that um, I'm sure you were excited about, you know, finally mm -hmm. we're gonna get, get, get somewhere. Um, would you say that it's both failed and, cons and, and succeeded when it comes to mortgage fraud? Failed in the sense that it didn't really properly investigate it, right? But succeeded, and this is important, in at least while it was there, well, when it was announced and, and since, the banks appear to have been spooked somewhat, if I can use that term, into pulling back on the level of fraud they were involved in. Would you say that's accurate? Oh, indeed, the Royal Commission is a mixed case. The Liberals voted against it 26 times, uh, and before that, Labor twice, even though they don't like to say that. No, don't, they don't. Given they appropriated the policy from um, the Green Senator, Peter Bush Wilson, who, who himself is a former banker. Yep. And what, they, what the Liberals did was sabotage it. And it had one Conservative uh, Commissioner, a very restricted terms of reference, limited resources, and only one year to investigate you're not going to find anything uh, within no. that period of time. So in that way, it was um, extremely limited. On the other hand, it has had the effect of uh, spooking the banks. Um, that you know, They've been named and shamed. Okay, it's, you know, full criminal prosecution would be much better, but at least this appears yep. to have a, an effect. And we've seen that in the uh, mortgage markets with uh, debt issuancing uh, peaking around 2017. And so unsurprisingly, that's when house prices peaked as well and now they're beginning to uh, rapidly fall. And that's because of the effect that the Royal Commission has had in causing the banks to look at their underwriting standards, which is absolutely central to all this, exactly as uh, William Black has uh, pointed out. Well, look, let's take a break. When we come back, 
stay tuned viewers because I want Philip to go through the details of these underwriting standards which and prove why the average size of the loans that banks issue are so much smaller now than they were before the Royal Commission and why they should be, right? And then you'll understand that, that will, which is what gives you a sense of the scale of the fraud that was being perpetrated um, before the Royal Commission. So we'll see you after the break. All right, welcome back to this special episode of the CEC Report where I'm interviewing Philip Seuss of LF Economics on the subject, only fraud can turn around falling house prices. Before the break, Philip, you raised the question of the underwriting standards of the banks when it came to mortgages had to be tightened because of the Royal Commission. Um, it, it spooked them that where could this, this, this investigation go? It didn't actually go very far, but that changed banks' practices um, and, and there's still that's still the case now, right? We can we can see that in the in the uh, in the size of the loans banks are giving out. So this is what I want Philip to go through in detail because he's a real expert on this. So let me set it up this way. Philip and I had a conversation a week ago, and I asked him this question I'm about to ask in front of you all, and um, and you'll see the uh, what Philip can explain as to why. So prices have been falling in Sydney and Melbourne now since 2017, since actually before the Royal Commission was called, because there was a sense that it was coming, right? Um, and now, though, we're getting, there's this concerted effort. Let's get them back up again. So we've got the, the government's first home buyer's deposit scheme, right? Just a pure effort to shove more people into the market. APRA dropping its benchmark against which mortgages should be written of 7% interest rates. The RBA signalling the strongest giving the strongest signal ever that it's going to cut rates and everyone's saying it's not going to cut once, it's going to cut twice, three times, even four times according to JP Morgan. Um, so those are the efforts that they're making to get this to get this going up. But assuming the banks stick to legal, sensible banking practices, will those efforts work? No, they won't. Even though the policies that you've listed uh, are stimulatory and they will certainly increase uh, borrowers' um, um, power in obtaining larger mortgages, that's been completely overwhelmed by the um, return to responsible lending um, standards uh, that the banks have been spooked into uh, uh, abiding by. And it's all well uh, written in the uh, NCCP Act, which governs uh, credit regulation uh, for lending. And it says that lenders must make um, reasonable steps to uh, verify uh, borrowers' income and uh, expense data, including uh, other financial information such as existing debts. Right. And uh, what we're seeing is that for the vast majority of the time, uh, over 80% um, of loans uh, pre-Royal Commission were originating, originating using some sort of income benchmark, such as a household expenditure measure. Uh, so not, actual, not their actual income, just a benchmark? That's right. And this was developed back in 2012 by the Melbourne Institute um, as an estimate of what borrowers' uh, likely ex uh, expenses would be on an annual basis. But for anyone who spent 10 minutes looking at the data, it's just uh, total nonsense. It's How? Why? Because you can look at what the, um, the ABS Household Expenditure Survey says, which is the, the real survey uh, which looks at um, households' ex uh, ex uh, expenditure habits in very fine detail. And for the typical uh, first home buyer household to use as a benchmark, yeah. their ex debt expenses are around uh, sixty-five thousand dollars a year, whereas according to the HEM, their basic variant, which eighty percent of the time was used, it was a very measly thirty-four percent. Thirty-four thousand. thirty-four thousand uh, uh, dollars a year. So actual expenses are 60, sixty-five, but mm -hmm. banks were able to say, "We'll we'll just say their expenses are thirty-four thousand. Yeah, basically half. And what this has is that it almost doubles the borrowing power of uh, a typical first home buyer household, which um, given current circumstances, if banks um, uh, abided by the rule of law, the most that a typical first home buyer household could take out is about a $400,000 loan. If you just use the HEM, uh, just that alone, yeah. that almost doubles it to $800,000. So it's a huge jump. Whoa. It is. Now, that's the expenses side. Was there also some, some um, changes on the income side that banks have had to apply? Yes. Um, we have less information about how inf uh, the shenanigans that the banks have been getting up to on income. 
We know from UBS research that according to um, the bank's own um, data, the average owner-occupier and, in, and investor um, household are alleged to have an income of, of around $230,000 a year, which basically puts them all within the top 5% uh, of households by income, which is highly unusual. And we also know from Denise Braley's... Just, hang on, just the, the, the average is 235. That's the average borrower has an income of $235,000 according to the banks. According to the banks from what UBS has been able to glean. <laughs> so this where, is this, where is this strange land of Australia that I thought I was part of? That's right. I don't live there. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks to the excellent work of Denise Braley, uh, she's been seeing all sorts of income inflation occur on uh, the loan application yeah. forms. I've seen uh, instances where uh, borrowers' um, household income has been inflated 30-fold um, to, to get uh, mega mortgages um, uh, over the line. And so we know the banks have been doing that as well. And on top of this, um, due to APRA guidance, uh, the banks are now having to um, uh, take haircuts of what they call uh, volatile sources of income, basically anything outside of um, the typical salary. So if the banks are now using properly verified income, plus making those haircuts, that has the effect of uh, radically reducing uh, borrowers' um, uh, mortgage power at the same time as banks are using proper verified income. And I've spoken to Martin North on this issue, and he said pre-Royal Commission, over 90% of loans uh, were originating using some sort of uh, expense benchmark. Yep. Today it's 45% and falling, so that's less than half. So less than half of the loans are now using the benchmark and, and what's the estimate of, of the percentage that means um, uh, the, the, the average loan size drops by? Oh, it's almost by half. By half. And that's a huge amount of money that used to be being pumped into the market and pumped through the rest of the economy therefore in what they call the wealth effect. Hmm. Right? That's a huge amount of money that is suddenly not there and that's why the um, prices have been falling and the, the average, you know, because the loan sizes are falling. So therefore, um, well, bef before I give you that leading question, uh, Westpac is in this court case at the moment with ASIC over, what does Westpac want to do? Westpac's justifying the HEM as being legal and does it want to go back to using the HEM? Uh, all the banks would prefer to go back to using these um, expense, ben uh, expense benchmarks simply because it allows them to approve um, uh, loans that should never be approved under the NCCP Act. So Westpac, including all the others, are very much hoping that um, they win against ASIC, whereas I'm hoping that uh, ASIC uh, certainly wins. But I know, um, talking to uh, others in the industry, that even if Westpac were to win, um, ASIC would move to um, re-legislate and ensure that the banks do um, make uh, proper efforts to verify um, uh, households' proper uh, expenses rather than using any kind of uh, benchmark. And the bottom line there then is if, if there is any kind of um, uh, policy change that banks have to stick to basically the truth <laughs> when it comes to writing mortgages, there's no way they can write loans the size they need to to push prices back up again. Oh, that's right. So if uh, the typical first home buyer, their borrowing power is essentially being halved or even more, um, then it's going to be very difficult for, the, uh, uh, for house prices to go straight back up, as some commentators are saying. It's going to take basically uh, a complete U-turn, even a very sharp V-turn, um, for the banks to completely drop uh, all their responsible lending obligations and to go straight back to what they were doing. And I don't see that happening, especially with ASIC's um, criminal prosecutions uh, in the works, because they've been um, shamed and embarrassed by the Royal Commission. All right, we need to take a break. We'll continue this after that. Welcome back to this special episode of the CEC Report, where I'm talking to Philip Seuss of LF Economics about only fraud can turn around falling house prices. And if you've been watching this, the episode, you would have seen Philip in the previous segment, I think, absolutely prove that. 
Um, but you were saying, so it's a question that you, you described the V-shape in terms of, of bank practices, right? They, they had to quickly uh, stop the fraud, loan sizes dropped, they would have to um, quickly resort to massive fraud again to get the, the V to go up the other side. You don't think that can happen because of what ASIC's doing. Any other reasons? Well, ASIC's um, certainly be shamed and fraud into actually doing something for the first time in its um, miserable existence since 1998. <laughs> and also the other um, development has been the um, growth of class action lawsuits. Yes. And like ASIC, um, these you know, private sector law firms are quite competent and uh, will go for the jugular um, in terms of um, hitting banks uh, where it hurts. And these are lawsuits about mortgage, for the victims of mortgage fraud? Uh, indeed. Um, for instance, um, we know that uh, Morris Blackburn is bringing a class action against uh, Westpac, and justifiably so. And we can hope that this will be followed by uh, further class actions. There are cases I know, one or two cases, where banks, the courts have ruled in favour of mortgage fraud victims and let them off the mortgage entirely. Would that be the objective of these of these? Um, class action lawsuits beyond just financial payouts, do you think? Could it have that implication? It's possible, or given the, um, the compensation that's provided, the loans can be written down to the ability to pay. So Denise Braley um, has been saying that one or two outcomes of successful um, actions. The first is that the loans get written off entirely and that borrowers are returned uh, to a financial situation as if they had never met the lender uh, previously. Right. So it's a blank slate. Yeah. Or they have their loans written down to the ability to pay. Uh, e either way is um, uh, it's definitely an improvement upon um, what a lot of borrowers are currently going through at the moment. No, exactly. Um, the uh, oh, One last question on this subject. Just explain to the viewers what the debt accelerator means. This is a technical term, but what does it mean and why is that sort of like the key factor in this? Because people don't buy houses with um, cash. People buy houses with uh, mortgage debt yep. because uh, of how high house prices are. Um, it's simply impossible for people to accumulate the cash reserves needed to just go out and buy um, all in one go. So people have to go to the bank take out a mortgage and pay it back over the next 25 years. And so you've got to look at how fast um, the banks are originating um, mortgages um, to see the effect it has upon house prices. So if uh, banks are originating a, a lot of a uh, great deal of um, mortgage um, loan volumes, you can expect um, house prices to go up. If, if um, the volume is going down, you can expect um, house prices to uh, deflate. And since 2017, that's e exactly what's been happening. Since you've had this tightening, uh, especially Melbourne and Sydney, we're seeing house prices um, quite, come down quite rapidly. And you're monitoring that debt accelerator figure, and despite all the hype, it hasn't changed yet? No, and interestingly, it has about a six to a nine month lead on annual house price growth. So it's a leading indicator, um, as with the sales to new listings ratio, the two very best le leading indicators of house prices that we have and both are currently plummeting at the moment. So we can say with um, uh, certainty that um, annual house price growth will continue to fall within the next uh, six to nine months. Well, Philip, I have to cut you off there. I'm gonna continue talking to Philip on, U on our YouTube show, but this is the end of the Channel 31 show. So Philip, thanks for being on the CEC report today and explaining that. He's proven that only fraud will get this back up again. But if you're watching Channel 31, get on our YouTube show and let's continue the interview. Welcome back to the CEC Report, this special episode talking to Philip Seuss about how only fraud can get house prices rising again. So Philip, I think you've proven your case. Um, just, you've, you've done a lot of work in this area. This is, this, this is, you monitor this in a detailed way, right? Um, and you've looked at all, uh, all of the factors. And, and um, I wanna ask you a question that I asked you the other day that proved this to me, that you really have looked at all the factors because this, this taught me something. There's an assumption that one of the things that makes Australia different from other countries, or like the United States when it, for, when it had its crash in 2007, 8 
is we have different types of mortgages. Our mortgages are full recourse mortgages. Mm. And as I've told you, I was in a meeting with in Joe Hockey's office in 2014 where the chief economist of the Treasurer of Australia basically said, oh, look, Australians can't afford to default on their mortgages, right? Because they can be pursued against the gra um, beyond the grave. Mm. And he made it sound like that was the ultimate insurance. So Australians would just bear this debt burden forever. They're not going to default. Why is that not true? Well, there's been research going back to 2010 by the Federal Reserve, and they looked at all 50 states in the US, including DC, looking at the legalities of uh, mortgage lending. And it turns out 39 states have full recourse loans, and the other 11 are um, non-recourse, um, including DC. And it's, they found essentially there was no difference between um, uh, the movement in house prices and mortgage lending um, across these states, with the only slight difference is that those in the full recourse states held onto their homes a little bit longer uh, before defaulting. And that uh, was backed up by further research that came out a couple of years later, which looked at the, um, the lending uh, legalities uh, across um, uh, developed countries. And it turns out every country out there has full recourse lending. And yet that didn't stop um, the bubble crashing in um, Ireland or Spain right. or Denmark or the Netherlands. So yeah. it tells us uh, basically nothing. Um, the thing about uh, full recourse is that if you don't have a job, you're going to default. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how much you'd like to um, keep on paying your mortgage. If you don't have that income coming in to pay down um, yeah. your debts, um, you're going to default. And if um, I, I imagine if, if, if your negative equity gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you just what's the point at a certain point? Mm. What, what, you know, what other, what other option do you have? So that, that's therefore alarming to me that I could ask you that question and you had all, all that um, st all those studies at your fingertips. Yet this was the chief economist of the Treasury of Australia saying this in 2014, mm. right? And we get a lot of denial in Parliament. Right, that there could that there could possibly be a problem, and you can see how that denial is just based purely on ignorance. The, the ones that are not spruikers themselves, you know, uh, it's mm, best mm, interest mm. in interest in the system. So, okay, right now there's a lot of hype. Let's talk about that again. The, um, you know, post election, you and I have contacts that are saying that, it, that they're passing on to us information. Mortgage brokers are saying that the week after the election was the best week mm, in mm. 20 years for mortgage brokers, <laughs> etc. Um, so that's the hype, but I, if you follow, if you're on Twitter, follow Philip on his Twitter feed because you put up a lot of um, pretty concrete stuff up there. What, so what are some of the concrete indicators that you're seeing when it comes to things like, you know, auction clearance rates and all those things they like to say? Oh, there's there's improvement. What what sort of things are you seeing that um, uh, indicators that contradict the hype? Well, as I mentioned before, the two best leading indicators are the debt accelerator and the sales to new listing ratio. With a six to nine month lead um, on annual house price growth, they're currently plummeting. So there's going to be no turnaround in um, house prices anytime soon. And on top of that, uh, the industry has made its case over the last few months that we're seeing uh, auction clearance rates rise, and that's going to herald um, an increase in house prices. But if you look at the underlying data, uh, the percentage of uh, auctions that are withdrawn have reached all-time highs, yeah, right. which helps to inflate that yeah. headline ratio. Yeah. And if you look at um, auction volumes, um, they've just collapsed um, across the country over the year. So that's, and the thing about it, this kind of information is freely available. It takes 10 seconds to find it on the internet. Yeah. So we sh certainly shouldn't believe the hype around the auction clearance rates. And then when it comes to these various other policies that you mentioned earlier, uh, the first home buyer policy, it's a total dud. It's capped at 10,000 um, uh, loans and it's simply not going to work because banks aren't going to want to lend uh, to such borrowers because if for loans that have a loan to value ratio um, above 80%, the banks have to hold a lot more capital in reserve. And given that there's no L uh, private um, LMI, uh, the banks have to hold even more on top of that. And so it's going to be a, a fairly... Um, Just hang on, L LMI is Lenders Mortgage, mortgage. Insurance. Yep, yep. And that's a fairly costly impost, uh, yep. anywhere from about five to $15,000. Yep. 
um, that the uh, borrower has to fork out on um, LVRs uh, uh, above 80%. And so given that's the case, the banks have to hold a lot more um, capital in reserve. They're really not going to want to lend to these um, uh, types of borrowers. No. And the Liberal Party must have come out with this kind of policy over breakfast <laughs> because they really have not thought about it. But I, I see it as a positive because if they've put this fairly useless FHB policy in place, I'm hoping that they then won't put a much more effective um, uh, FHB policy, which is the uh, typical... Shh, uh, don't tell them. Typical <laughs> grants that um, Howard did in 2000, 2001, and Rudd did in 2008, yeah, 2009. Yeah, yeah. And that really did help inflate the market. Yeah, definitely. Um, and on the APRA serviceability um, uh, rates, they've, they've cut it down from the um, headline 7%, and they're saying now, depending on what, what they decide in uh, later in June, that they'll take the mortgage interest rate and then apply a 2.5% buffer. But if you look at um, current interest rates for you know, investment lending for both uh, uh, principal interest and um, interest only, the 2.5% the is simply going to push it straight back into around that, um, into that 7% range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be very difficult for investors to take upon um, more debt. So the only real beneficiary will be first home buyers. And that's only if they can source um, mortgages at much lower interest rates. So at the moment, they can obtain mortgages for about 4%. So you add 2.5% on that, that's still 6.5%. Uh, and that only has an effect of, say, increasing their borrowing power by about fifty to $75,000, um, which, which is, is nowhere near the half that average loans have, have collapsed by. In, in, that's right. And that's just based on um, shifting from the HEM yeah. to verified expenses. And that doesn't include the further decrease in borrowing power that comes from using verified uh, uh, income in, and um, income haircuts on volatile sources. And so the, the supposed benefit that comes from the RBA adjusting their um, serviceability rate it is completely overwhelmed. Um, by the banks actually using proper verified um, uh, income from borrowers. So there's a massive drop in what banks lend on average from just tightening up their standards. Mm. And everything that has been talked about so far is just little incremental things down here that may, that, that will have an, an effect, but just tiny ones that nowhere make up for that massive drop. Mm. But how can you turn around the housing market unless banks can go back to making those kind of massive loans that are eight times, ten times income? Well, the short story is they can't. And even if the RBA does cut, say, for instance, the chief economist of Westpac, Bill Evans, is saying that the RBA is going to cut three times to uh, 0.75 by November, or uh, JP Morgan saying um, they're going to cut to 0.5 by next year, um, due to the usual um, uh, power of the banks, um, their oligopolistic uh, 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 industry, uh, their, their power, they're not going to pass on the entirety of those um, rate cuts. You know, there's been a slight increase in uh, uh, funding costs yeah. and, and including their profitability is taking a dive uh, due to the Royal Commission. So in no way are they going to pass on the entirety of the rate cut, maybe half. And even then, it's still not going to benefit um, first home um, buyers all, the, all that much and it's not going to um, really benefit um, investors either. So as long as this, uh, even if APRA does recommend just a 2.5% increase, and interestingly, um, the current buffer that um, APRA recommends is about 2, 2.25%, uh, and they're advocating it be increased to 2.5%. Ah. And so combined with the uh, mortgage interest rate, it's really not gonna have that much of an effect in increasing borrowers' um, buying power, and also, those who are asp aspiring to buy, they can see that prices are currently falling uh, quite hard at the moment, especially in Melbourne yeah, and Sydney. Yeah. So it's a case of, okay, even if I can um, bump up my loan size, uh, do I really want to? Because I don't want to catch a falling knife. They're being, yeah, they're being hyped up into it, but it's, it's a different, what was it called before? Fear of missing out. Turned into, definitely turned into fear of not getting out, mm. Fongo. How do they turn that around suddenly to say fear of missing out when they don't have rising prices?
Now, one of the assumptions here is that that, that when they when people think we can turn this around, there's an assumption that that we've had a we, you know, we could look at what's been done so far as a soft landing down 10% Melbourne, 15% mm. Sydney. It's a soft landing. It was always going to be a soft landing. Now it can go back up, right? But isn't it true from the international experience that house price for when when you have these big crashes like has happened in Ireland, etc. It does start slow and it progresses fairly slow. And you can, there was plenty of times in Ireland where they said, oh, we've had a soft landing. Mm, mm. And, but it, it doesn't stop and it can go on for, you know, it reaches a certain point where it falls off a cliff. That's right. So at the beginning, because you only have a, a, a slight slowdown in, the, in mortgage lending, in the debt accelerator, by definition, um, uh, the decline in house prices will be uh, fairly uh, slow. As that process uh, f builds upon itself and then the fear and the panic does reach a certain point, then the falls uh, accelerate just um, because that's been driven by the, the, the tightening of yeah. um, lending standards, but also by borrowers who are simply un unwilling uh, to go out and load themselves uh, down with a mortgage to buy um, an, one, a single undiversified asset that is currently um, uh, plummeting in price. And you and I were told... Um this week about a case where from one mortgage broker where he submitted nine, and this is key, investor loans before the election that were turned down, resubmitted them after the election and claimed that six of those nine investor loans were approved. That was the claim. But I was struck by the fact that they're investor loans because they are the ultimate people who are looking for that capital price increase, mm -hmm. right? And if they don't see that in the next month, two, three, four, then you get to, the, there's so many, Eddie Hobbs, the uh, financial expert in New Zealand that Martin North has interviewed, he's really struck by the fact that 40% of the loans are investor loans in mm, Australia, mm. right? If they start getting panicked and that stampede from the market, then there's no stopping this. Well, that's an interesting uh, point you make because with all the hype we've been seeing in the media over the last few months with the auction clearance rates and all these uh, uh, new policies, from the Liberals, the Reserve Bank and APRA. The industry's uh, really uh, putting a lot of hope into this. Yep. And if they don't get the kind of uh, house price inflation um, they want, then the investors can look, say, uh-oh, if that's not going to inflate house prices, what will? then, then, then uh, yeah, what will, apart from, say, a $100,000 first home buyer grant, yeah, yeah. which will be the ultimate bribery, yep. Um, and then that's really going to um, induce uh, fear and panic um, once more. And we could see a, another drop off. Okay, final um, question from me. What does this mean? Just explain for the viewer, what does it mean for the banks when prices fall and the, therefore the loan to valuation ratios rise? What, is the, what do the banks have to do in those circumstances so they can get a sense of the risk the banks are starting to have to deal with? Well, according to uh, the Basel rules um, uh, from the Accords, uh, there's risk-weighted uh, uh, tranches. So, for instance, if you if uh, a mortgage has a uh, and a property has a very low loan-to-value ratio, say below sixty percent, they only have to hold a small amount of capital against it. But as it uh, rises 70, 80, 90 percent, and including uh, LMI or without LMI, yeah. uh, that capital um, requirements uh, rise uh, quite strongly. So as um, house prices fall, um, the, the portfolio and the aggregate um, uh, loan-to-value ratios um, rise in, the, in their loan books, and that means that banks have to hold uh, more and more capital. And uh, that becomes um, quite a uh, clog for the banks because at the same time, APRA is now pushing them to, um, to uh, hold uh, tens of billions of more in capital. Yep. At the same time, uh, prices are coming down, which means that the banks have to... Um, somehow uh, find even more capital. And, and that's um, the pro-cyclical type of uh, uh, lending we're, we're seeing at the moment. So as house prices have been rising, um, you know, 2013, 2017, um, and the um, LBRs are going down, that just allows banks um, uh, the ability to lend even more, which pushes up prices even more and so on. It's a self-sustaining um, positive and feedback. They take capital away that they've been holding against those older loans because the the, uh, the, the, va the value of the house is so much greater now. Mm, so they mm. take that capital away. Now we're seeing the contraction of that. That's right. So Reverse it's leverage. <laughs> uh, pr pretty much so. But 
The uh, question is, um, as my North has also brought up, is that the, re the APA regulations stipulate that when the banks become aware of a material um, change in house prices, they must revalue um, their loan portfolios. Material. But the thing about it is that we have no idea what that term material means, <laughs> and we have no idea if the banks um, actually routinely implement uh, revaluations. So I, I would assume as house prices are rising, they do it very rapidly yep. um, to ensure they hold less and less capital. Yep. But on the way down, I'm pretty sure they definitely slow down um, the rate at which they're doing their uh, revaluations. Now, Martin North, I did, I did him say a month or so ago that he thinks that at 20%, they would have to. They can't pretend it's not material at, at, mm -hmm. uh, at 20%. And then, so you can get to these, these sort of uh, fence posts along the way where um, it's not a linear process because suddenly it, 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 everything happens, a lot, a lot has to happen at once and it, it can be, have quite a sharp impact at those key points. And another one that you've pointed out is if um, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 there's a lot of loans bunched around 79% loan to value ratio mm -hmm. to, so that they don't have to pay lenders mortgage insurance, but that means if these, if these values come down, you'll get a lot of people suddenly in big trouble at that, who've, who've had their mortgage at that level. Yeah, that's uh, something that, that we've found, is that uh, typically uh, borrowers will, will try to push um, their loan to value ratio down uh, below 80%, uh, so they don't have to uh, pay for that uh, impost, which is quite expensive. It can get up to you know, $15,000. And so... And when you say push it down, what that means is often, as we've heard, mm getting their deposit, not by saving it up, but on credit card mm -hmm. and multiple credit cards, et cetera, just to get below that 20%, uh, slightly higher than 20% deposit. It's fascinating because uh, a few years ago, Genworth, one of the uh, LMI providers, um, in their last survey on the issue, uh, they asked um, buyers what your deposit consisted of. And it certainly wasn't a, a true sort of cash equity deposit. No. A, a lot of it had um, credit card debt in it, personal debts. Um, borrowing from family and relatives, um, other forms like inheritance. And so we can see that a lot of um, first home buyers and uh, investors um, simply don't have that sort of true cash um, equity deposit, which means that their, the true uh, loan to value ratio is actually higher than, we, um, than is on paper. And it, it's even worse than that because the interest rates on those kinds of debts like credit card debt are much higher than that of, of um, mortgage debt. Crazy. And so that's um, an, another risk that's uh, underappreciated by our regulators. You could already be having 5% deposits in practice and the, that other, the so-called, the rest of the 20% deposit is all on a much higher interest rate. And yeah, Martin it's North debt on debt. has uh, found this um, in his own uh, household servers as well. So there's quite, quite good uh, evidence for it. And so as uh, prices fall, um, so just say prices fall 21% from the peak, um, a, a lot of those recent buyers, um, that we could suddenly find themselves um, in a big spike in negative equity as it hits around that 79% mark with, all, yeah. with that bunching. And, and if prices fall, uh, continue to fall below 21%, um, it'll cumulatively hit those who have uh, purchased in previous years. And so while the RBA and industry sources say that the um, uh, increase in uh, negative equity has been uh, fairly small mm. for the time being. It can jump uh, very fast. It, it can jump very fast. And we also know that the banks themselves have been getting up to a lot of uh, dodgy shenanigans with the way that they measure um, the LVR on an on um, individual basis. So to give an example of this, just say you've got a homeowner that owns a million dollar home and they've got a loan that's $100,000 remaining. That's uh, LVR of 10%. That's yeah, very yeah, low risk. Yeah. It's imperceptible. Sure. So just say they take out a $900,000 loan to buy a million dollar um, investment property. Right. Now that's an LVR of 90%. Mm. But what the banks do, um, uh, they combine uh, the LVR at the portfolio, portfolio level. Against the two homes. That's right. So you've got $2 million in assets, a million dollars in debt, and so they list the overall LVR as... Um, 50%. Now, that's true because the assets and liabilities remain the same. But what this does is that the banks hide risk. Yeah. Because a 50% um, LVR on the portfolio looks fairly um, 
low risk. But the thing about it is that it's hiding that higher, much higher risk yeah. of the yeah. 90% for the investment property. Yeah. And it's only going to take a small fall in prices um, uh, for that uh, borrower to be in negative equity against the investment property. And as we know from uh, the voluminous research that's been done since the GFC, those in negative equity have a two to five times higher uh, probability of defaulting on their mortgage. Mm. And so it, it's all sense, about yeah. hiding that risk. Yeah. But it gets even worse, if you can believe that. Just say that homeowner has split that $900,000 loan into $450,000 as fixed and $450,000 as variable. Yeah. The, the banks then take an unweighted um, average of the LVR. So they take the 10% for um, LVR for the home, yeah. 45%, oh, 45% no. again. So they combine it, that's 90%. As, um, yeah. uh, sorry, that's 100% as it is at the portfolio level. But then they divide it by three without weighting it. So what's 100 divided by three? 33. 33%. And, and, and therefore they can push the LVR down e even lower. Well, and see, that's probably technically legal, but for all intents and purposes, it's fraud. Yeah, it's all about hiding the risk yep. and then uh, presenting um, uh, a sound you know, financial management to, to the markets, to the shareholders and uh, uh, you know, to the parliament, to the public and saying everything is fine. Look how low the, um, the portfolio and the aggregate um, LVRs are in our loan books. It's all safe. Well, look, um, and the point I want to make in, in closing is that the, the banks are victimising people when they're doing this, but they're also fooling themselves, mm. right? And that's the, that's the issue. It's why we always say that a, a house price crash, a housing crash is going to hurt people. But what the authorities know, it's the financial institutions that are in deep crisis here. And that's why they, they, they're prepared to resort to um, desperate measures. So, to the viewer, if you see a remarkable turnaround in the next little period in Australia, the rest of the year in Australia or whatever, that proves all the spruikers to be right, think about this show because what, you'll, what you have to know is that f they have gone back to fraud on a massive scale to be able to do that. And although you've said, Philip, that you think that you've seen some signs from ASIC that it, that it wants to um, impose certain permanent standards, we also know... I did a, um, we promoted recently a, a paper by Wilson Sy, the, mm. the, 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 uh, the farce of fake regulation, that at the end of the day, these banks, these, these regulators are captured by the banks, mm. right? And if that's what they're prepared to do, that's what they'll do. So this either, you're, this either Philip will either be dead right and we are heading fast into a massive crisis, or if it's turned around temporarily, all they've had, the, the only way they've done it is resort to massive fraud. So, Remember this date. This is 31st of May um, 2019. You've heard it here. Let's see what happens. But Philip, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming on the CEC Report. Glad to be here. That was excellent. And thanks to the viewer. Tune in next week for more of the show.